Hello and most welcome to 1349 of the Heidegger series. I will continue the article of Terence W. Deacon and Tyrone Cashman. Steps to Metaphysics of Incompleteness. There will be a link to the article in the description. Deacon is covering a lot of different areas. And one of those is language and how it evolved and how it co-created the brain. So he's a an explorer into knowledge itself in a very interesting way. And I think this is the starting point to understand his thinking. We will in later lectures go further. There are some books that he's published before. Symbolic Species, for instance. A co-evolution of language and brain. And oddly enough, you see the inscription here, Kushbuk. It means it's a part of a literary course or a study course at the university. Which is in itself a bit of a surprise, I would say. And here we have his masterpiece, Incomplete Nature. How mind emerge from matter and I will in the second lecture I do today 1350 take a couple of quotes from both books but now I continue with the foundation so you get sort of an insight into the tricks of Terence Deacon and of course Tyrone Cashman And I left off at page 1414 and uh, we were talking about the living organism and the problem with teleono teleonomy, that's a tough word, that is directedness or goal orientation and it is a problem that puzzled biologists and evolutionists for more than a century now. And I would say it's a problem that turns up in all areas. Usually it is something to be avoided, it seems to be. Makes for less science as to do as Aristotle to see a goal in things or a direction. Autogenesis and teleodynamics. A core aim of incomplete nature, that's the book I showed before, is to demonstrate that teleological phenomena are as real and physical as are mass and energy. But to make this a scientific enterprise it is not helpful to simply assume that teleological properties are 
ubiquitous in nature and need no explanation. We must indeed instead show how these properties fit with and diverge from those identified in physics and chemistry, for which no teleological concepts suffice, and therefore how they can emerge from prior physical processes that lack these properties. To accomplish this paradoxically requires that we must follow the strictures on introducing teleological properties as explanatory principles. Thus, we need to assume eliminativism in order to demonstrate that it does not provide a complete metaphysics. Assuming this reductio stance helps to avoid unwittingly smuggling unexplained teleological principles into the proposed explanation of how teleological properties can emerge. To this end, we have developed a simple thought experiment in which all of the processes involved are known phys physical chemical processes and their interrelationships are simply enough to ensure that no unexplained mechanism is invoked. Cool. 
the central claims proposed in incomplete nature are derived from an analysis of just such a simple and empirically testable thought experiment. Despite the simplicity of the physics and chemistry invoked and the transparency of the dynamical assumptions involved, we believe that this moral system is sufficient to provide an Un unambiguous proof of principle. That teleological properties including function, semiosis, self and value can emerge from components and interactions that in isolation exhibit none of these properties. This model mole molecular system is called an autogene and it is loosely based on the self-assembly processes involved in the formation of viruses, though without the involvement of DNA, RNA, or parasitic dependency. It also superficially resembles theoretical processes described as autopoietic. My comment here, you remember autopoietic from Francisco Varela and Roberto Maturano. End of comment. Although it was specifically formulated to address some central insufficiencies 
of this concept, including the misleading assumption that self-organization is a top-down mood of causality. That can account for the higher order self-preserving unity and intrinsically semiotic nature of living and mental processes. A simple autogen consists of a reciprocally, reciprocally reinforcing linkage between two different but complementary self-organizing molecu molecular processes. The most basic form of this relationship involves a reciprocally catalytic cycle comprising at least two catalysts that besides producing one another also produces a side product molecule that tends to self assemble into a polyhedral container or tube. Given supportive energetic and substrate conditions, reciprocal catalysis will rapidly deplete the local concentration of substrates, increase the local concentration of reciprocal catalysts and increase the local concentration of capsid forming molecules.
but unless there is some inhibition or diffusion the interacting catalysts will diffuse away to the point that catalysis ceases. In parallel, the rate of capsid formation will be most rapid and efficient where the local concentration of capsid formation molecules is high and will slow as this concentration drops. The reciprocal catalytic process described above we tend to continuously replenishes, replenish the local concentration of capsid forming molecules as the capsid grows and growth of this containment will diminish diffusion of reciprocal catalysts. With capsid formation occurring most rapidly where reciprocal catalysis is most rapid. The two processes will tend to strongly co-localize. The result will be a high probability that capsids will enclose the very catalysts that produce themselves as well as this containment.
my comment here, do think about what was mentioned in 1348 about the pages and Gödel's experiment. It is a sort of self-containment going on. End of my quote. Though inert when enclosed, These processes will be reinitiated if the capsid is disrupted, e.g., by the effects of heat in the presence of catali catalytic substrates, and thus reconstitute itself, that is, repair, damage. Depending on the extent of capsid disruption, the reconstitution process might resume in a more distributed way, thus resulting in the production of two or more replicas a form of replication. The logic of simple autogenesis is depicted in figure four. There is an interesting analogy between the logic or buzzer function mentioned earlier and autogenesis. Both alternate between two states that when each is achieved inevitably and necessarily will lead to its own cessation and the initiation of the other.
both systems cycle between a relaxation phase that is relaxing the spring and going to temporary equilibrium respectively. and a work phase. Both also are set up so that this will continue indefinitely so long as supportive conditions are present. Of course, there is a fundamental and critical difference. The autogene's dynamical organization serves to prevent the loss of this capacity by working against any disruptive influence. A buzzer's alternating states are merely each other's precipitating conditions, making each other more probable, but they play no part in whether or not this capacity is maintained. Like the more complex reciprocal, reciprocal constellations of complementary self-organizing processes that constitute simple organisms, the constraint generating dynamics of each of the component self-organizing processes in autogenesis reciprocally generate each other's supportive boundary conditions. This reciprocal codependent maintenance of critical boundary conditions constitutes a source of autonomy 
by providing a persisting locus for the specific global constraints required to channel energy in a way that does the work of continually preserving this very capacity. Deacon has termed this indirected self-preserving process organization teleodynamics. In order to highlight its intrinsically and directed disposition. And my comment here is this is in distinction to the concept of Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela of auto genesis this intrinsic source of persistence is a critical distinguishing feature the critical boundary conditions for any self-organizing process are entirely provided by factors extrinsic to that process. For example, all the conditions that contribute to the persistence of a whirlpool in a stream are imposed extrinsic to the whirlpool. Whereas some of the most critical conditions that contribute to the persistence of an organism are intrinsic to that organism. Although living organisms are as dependent on an environmental energy gradient as is a whirlpool,
the whirlpool's form is directly dependent on a constant flow of material and energy. Whereas our form is only intermittently dependent on an energy gradient. And moreover, while a whirlpool, like other self-organized systems, is organized in a way that most effectively dissipates the gradient that produces it. An organism uses energy and material gradients to repair any degree of organizational degradation. So a self-organizing process alone or merely linked with others cannot be a locus of its own autonomous self-regulation. Only this codependence of reciprocal boundary conditions can provide what amounts to autonomous self-preservation and a precise dynamical determination of self versus non-self. This intrinsically maintained self-specification is both self-referential and self-determinative.
in semiotic terms this form of higher order reciprocal constraint on constraint generation is effectively a form of information that is dynamically interpreted when it channels work to produce a second replica of the original physical system. in which it will again become embedded complete with this same future capacity. This higher order constraint is thus substrate transferable because it can be maintained across complete replacement of the molecules that preserve and generate it. It is information, a form that informs what makes this form of constraint more than a mere restriction, structure, or regularity is that its most distinctive property is not anything present or intrinsic but rather something that it potentiates something that it makes more likely to happen in the future. We argue that autogenesis exemplifies the simplest form of molecular system that can constitute a living being whereas processes described as autopoietic If they only involve 
self-organized processes. that are not reciprocally codependent cannot provide the autonomous self reparative self reconstituting self replicating dynamics necessary to distinguish the system itself from its umwelt. Such a reciprocal form generating dynamics is the foundation for biosemiotics because signs are ultimately forms that are interpreted via the generation of new forms which in turn further contribute to the persistence of this interpretive dynamics. My comment here, it's a system of interpretation and already here we can sort of have a feel for his semiotic linguistic inclinations as well. The synergy constraint between self-organized processes that is preserved in autogenesis is thus a formal sign which is interpreted by the process of being preserved by an autogenic repair or replication Lacking this self-referential dynamics, there can be no other to be represented and no interpretive self for which this other is relevant. And I will make a little summary here. While I was reading here, I got an image that I will put on, on the whiteboard. So usually we show the autopoietic tendencies in autogenesis as the cell. And this one has been figuring here in the university library for the last five years uh, infrequently, but still. This is, so to speak, complete in itself. It regenerates, it replicates. So everything is contained within the system. And in a way, 
the outside is 100% complete in itself. So I'm going to make the outside look like a ball as well. And the thing that is pointed to here clearer than I experienced before is this sort of is 100% solipsistic but oddly enough being 100% realistic. There is no 50-50 position here. And this is of course not how we normally perceive things. But this, I would say, this is my take. This is an expansion of Maturana and Varela, which is very interesting. And this is called teleogenomy, and purpose here becomes the singular most prominent and important feature there is a, definitely a stress on telos here it has an internal purpose because the purpose cannot be derived neither from the constructions of the outside nor the interior constructions. Why is that? The reason is, of course, we've been looking at the interior of the cell from a perspective of exteriority, from a lab position, from a chemical position, from a mechanistic position. But how it was now further explained, one understands that that is a mixture that is not allowed. From within the cell, there can be no outside view. The cell itself doesn't have access to those things. One could say, also my own take here, that usually there is an unlawful mixture of interior and exterior that causes problems in understanding what is life and what is a telos. Uh, I'm sure my uh, colleague Kalle here that's a question. I just want to add that Kali had a sort of epiphany yesterday. I had a light epiphany. I'm really thankful for this reiteration of autopoiesis by Terence Deacon. It helped me in my understanding. Mm, autopoiesis, yes. It has been applied to uh, literature and it's fascinating and I, I will recommend you then a paper to you that I found uh, very useful but uh, the problem with autopoiesis as I understand it is that you forget the frame the environment uh, and we have criticized Darwin and Dawkins and uh, and uh, we can also criticize Varela for the same reason that it's as the same as the name says, autopoiesis is its own it's it's its own. Where is the frame? Don't you need the environment or do we need it? What do you think? Well I say thank you very much, Kalle. What an excellent question. That is something to think of. And to be honest, I am learning at the same time. I do not have a good answer to that, but let me get back to that.
It's okay, Carla. It's excellent question. Excellent question. Uh, and I will take a little pause here and I will continue the read. And we continue. Welcome back. The partial analogy with the buzzer is that both alternate between an energy-driven phase and a relaxation phase such that each potentiates the initiation of the other. In the phase of the autogenic process, when its containment is breached and its contents are spilled into the environment. It is energetically active and entropy increases as catalysis generates new molecular components and self-assembly rebuilds the molecular container. This is roughly analogous to the energetic phase of buzzer dynamics. Which is driven by the flow of current that produces a magnetic field. The pull of the magnet does work on the contact bar. Pulling it away from its equilibrium condition where the spring is tensed. In autogenesis, the molecular work continues
until closure stops the catalytic process and entropy production ceases. This is roughly analogous to the way that the electromagnetic pulling on the contact bar breaks the circuit and shuts itself off, thus stopping work and allowing the spring to spontaneously contract mechanism to fall back to a relaxed state. But resetting conditions for the energetic process to occur, to recur. Unlike a buzzer, however, autogenesis cycles between spontaneous disruption of its critical structural integrity and active reconstitution of it. Although most living organisms maintain their critical functioning inside a membrane, a skin, a shell or exoskeleton, these are only artifactual correlates of what actually separates self from other. And this is an enormously important point. Similarly, while in its inert closed state, an autogene is unambiguously physically bounded, defining an inside and an outside. But its shell is not what individuates it. And possibly here, my comment, there is disjunction to Varela. End of my comment.
First, the shell is a critical constituent of the material autogene and so is not merely a separator. Second, the individuation and persistence of autogenic organization is maintained even when this physical boundary is breached. and non-contained catalysts and capsid molecules are distributed in the surrounding environment in the process of reconstituting the inert state. Like all organisms, it is both unambiguously individuated and distinct from its surroundings, while also exchanging its constituents with substances from the environment. Its individuated continuity is therefore not materially constituted. This prompts the question, what persists across the transitions of autogene reconstitution and reproduction despite complete replacement of its material constituents? Absence and constraint. Something clearly is conserved within a long lineage of broken and reconstituted autogenes. even if there is no particular material or energy that is preserved along the way. Because that something is not only preserved, 
but is critical to the self-similarity of the material autogenic structure that iteratively and persistently repairs itself. It must also definitely exist and yet although it must always be exemplified in some physical structure or local collection of structures. It is clearly not identical to these material energetic features. What exists and persists is a form, but it persists because of a constraint. But a constraint is something that prevents something else. It may be something external, like a container that prevents movement of liquid from flowing out. Or an intrinsically generated limitation. like the way that water flowing around an obstruction will form into a whirlpool where the internal tendency to regu regularize limits the persistence of more chaotic flow patterns. What persists in the standing whirlpool over time is this intrinsically generated constraint on the pattern of flow.
that this persistence is entirely determined extrinsically. If the flow changes significantly, it can vanish. Though intrinsic forces within the local water flow generate the whirlpool regularity, They only exist because of the extrinsic flow. So the whirlpool's existence is an entirely dependent existence. The situation is more complicated for the autogene. As described above, both the reciprocal catalytic and self-assembling processes involved in autogenesis generate constraints. In this respect, each is analogous to a whirlpool that constrains the pattern of the flow so long as there is continual throughput. They each only continue so long as resources are available. When coupled as in autogenesis, their codependence takes the place of some of this extrinsic constraint. Thus, reciprocal catalysis drives local catalyst and capsid molecule 
concentrations. Temporarily beyond equilibrium concentration in a way that keeps pace with the rate that the self-assembly process decreases capsid con concentration. temporarily beyond equilibrium concentration in a way that keeps pace with the rate that the self-assembly process decreases capsid concentration. Do ponder about that. And the self assembly of the impermeable shell restricts diffusion that might otherwise allow the local concentration of catalysts to drift toward equilibrium. These two constraint generating processes each produce the other's required boundary conditions. <laughs> there you go. But this codependence or mutual interdependence is an additional constraint, an additional prevention. It prevents each component process from reaching local equilibrium and stopping. Because of the way each component process is regulated by the other, this reciprocity constraint 
has the curious property of preserving itself. It is a constraint that indirectly presents itself and the whole material dynamic process from fading out of existence unlike the world food and other merely self-organized processes. The autogenic process is maintained by this intrinsic constraint that specifically counteracts any tendency for the organization of the whole to dissipate. A constraint is reflected in what doesn't occur, in what is absent or prevented. In the case of the autogene, what is prevented is the ubiquitous second law tendency for the constraint, constraints it generates to be fully dissipated. Their reciprocal codependence prevents each of the component constraint generating processes from being eliminated. In a strange sense, then, preventing certain potential chemical and thermodynamic processes from occurring prevents this prevention from being eliminated too. It is the continued absence or what could have otherwise occurred that this absence perpetuates.
it is in this higher order constraint on constraint generating processes that forms the core feature we identify with the self other distinction that defines an organism self in this sense is that which has a disposition to resist going out of existence I comment going bankrupt in the context of the ubiquitous second law of thermodynamics all constraints tend to get dissipated in time so like Alice through the looking glass running with the Red Queen just to stay in one place. A constraint far from equilibrium system can only persist by constantly working in the opposite direction to the second law. In the world as understood by Plato and Aristotle Form could exist irrespective of work to produce and maintain it. But form is a reflection of constraint. And in the world as we know it, in which entropy increase incessantly, breaks down constraints. The persistence of form cannot be assumed. In previous works, it has been tempting to emphasize the ontological importance of absence relations.
by using the somewhat misleading phrase, the efficacy of absence. This rhetorical trope unfortunately undermines the point that it intends to emphasize. So a bit of conceptual repair is necessary before proceeding further. In the brief discussion of the Tao Te Ching mentioned above. Verse 11 was described as a sort of synopsis of the essence of the logic underlying incomplete nature, which is Deacon's seminal book. The opening line of the verse, as I said, cites the hole at the hub of the wheel. The hole is an example of what Deacon calls a constitutive absence and was used as a metaphor for the property that characterizes a word's meaning. A shovel's function or an organism's purposes. That is the property of existing in relation to something not immediately present. And here, uh, Deacon departs somewhat from the idea of Varela slash Maturana. He is keeping the borders of autogenesis, the new word constructed by Varela and Maturana. But the physical molecular border between inside the cell and outside is according to Deacon not constituting the restraint. The physical border is not the restraint. And this is a very precise redefinition or deeper understanding of autogenesis, I would say. Instead, there is a telos of self-preservation, of course, 
the autopoietic force. But the borders are not physical. And that is a major difference, although on the surface, immediately, it might seem as the very same. But this is also the reason for Terence renaming autogenesis or his telos driven cell, organism, life can also be the whirlpool. This is of course extraordinary interesting and in this lecture I'm afraid two <laughs> major questions came up at the same time. I am not sure uh, that is that thing had happened before during any of the 1300 lectures so it's, of course, very taxing on the understanding, but it is at the same time enormously interesting. So the physical border of Maturana Virala is not constituting the restraint. The restraint is something different, although this is important, it almost always take, takes the form of a physical border. And in some ways, the two things could be impossible to separate. But Deacon here proves they can be separated. It's a bit tough here, but questions now, maybe from my dear colleague Kalle. Thank you. I put Hans. him into the camera here. So, what I like about this article is their uh, criticism of Plato and Aristotle. And Plato's, Plato thought that ideas or shapes could exist independently, while Beacon and Cashman they highlight that you need work to sustain these forms. That's good, excellent. However, what I, um, what I would like to criticize or put into question is, is their renaming of autopoiesis. And, and you uh, has especially have uh, mentioned Derrida's criticism of renaming things. So uh, I quote from um, Cashman and Dick on page 418, Self in this sense, sense in this sense, okay, excuse me, let me take it from the beginning. Take self, it slowly. Self, so to self, self like in auto boy, autogenesis. Self in this sense is that which has a disposition to resist going out of existence, that you has explained as bankrupt, to go in bankrupt. Yes. That was a good um, paraphr paraphrasis. But the thing is that can we really only rename things uh, to make something work? Uh, and here, auto means self, as I mentioned. I think that the whole construction is, is a paradox that doesn't work, because it means that something in itself can work. And uh, they said that you need work, but is you need something from the outside that they themselves uh, highlight them that you need like a, if you are a whirlpool you need waters coming outside to sustain it so the autogenesis itself is an is an platonic thought or uh, also a newtonian idea that something can be in itself um auto voices I think it's a paradox that doesn't really work. You need always an absence, as they, Deacon and Cashman themselves point out, you need always an absence. So all the voices itself, it, that something that can uh, generate itself is an impossibility. Please Hans, let me turn around the camera. <coughs> But 
And by the risk of sounding sycophantic, it was once more a very good comment, Kalle. Thank you very much. Yes, there is definitely a paradox inside this. And I would say for me that paradox was already present in when I read uh, Verala and Maturana in the 90s. I wasn't able to resolve it. And most definitely it remains what is a self? What is the thing that is trying not to go into bankruptcy? And uh, maybe Terence W. Deakin can answer that question. We don't know yet. But it's a very, it's an incredibly important thing to think about. And is there a tendency of sheer renaming only? And with that, also remember to many, many sides and aspects, autopoiesis and the new expression that brings in telos are conceptually and de facto indiscernible. They do amount to the same thing. So Terence is, I would imagine we have to read further, is pinpointing a certain aspect. And he's going to expand that hopefully, and we will see what will happen. I say thank you very much for your patience. This was, I have to admit, very taxing on myself because it was two tough questions in one lecture. I don't think it happened. Okay, have a very pleasant morning. Bye-bye. Thank you.